Now, okay, here are some principles. Here are some principles. Older manuscripts, if you have a manuscript dated from the 16th century and you have one dated from the 3rd century, which one do you put more weight on? 3rd century, okay? It's earlier. So we want older, the older manuscripts, the more uh, status they have. The older the manuscript, the better. The shorter reading is preferred. The shorter reading is preferred. Why do they prefer the shorter reading? You got two sets of manuscripts going. Why do they prefer the shorter one? Did the text have a tendency to grow over time? So the shorter one is probably the older and better one. So they do the shorter reading is to be preferred. Church of the Lord, Church of God. Now, let me just do this. Uh, suppose we have 100 manuscripts from, from Wenham in Massachusetts. We have 100 manuscripts from Wenham. We've got, on the other hand, a set of five manuscripts that disagree with the Wenham manuscript. One of those manuscripts is from Washington, D.C. One of it's from Philadelphia. Uh, we don't do New York City and, and Boston here. Boston is the other one, and uh, L.A. is the other one, and Miami is the other one. Only got five, only got five, but one's from Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, L.A., and Miami. And you got a hundred from, from, uh, from Wenham. Which one, which reading would you accept? The five or the hundred? The five, why? Because they're spread all over the place. Would the ones in Wenham all be copying from each other? Would they all have the same mistakes? But the ones that would be spread out, so the greater the geographical spread, the more valuable the reading. Now, the numbers and types of the manuscripts, what's a manuscript family? A manuscript family is you have a parent, the parent is copied, that's called a child. You have the parent, the child, the child gets copied, and you see that they all go back to the same parent. So one gets copied, say, five times, they all go back to the same parent. Are different families, you know what I'm saying, do, are certain families better manuscripts and other families worse manuscripts? And so what happens is you can evaluate these families of manuscripts. You have the like Western family, the Alexandrian family, and you can weigh the manuscripts until so you try to pick the better family of manuscripts and things. Now, okay, before we get that, let me hit one more thing here as far as, let me do the New Testament. I want to contrast for you the New Testament. Were the New Testament scribes, the people who copied the New Testament, what kind of, were they good scribes? The people that copied the New Testament, were they good scribes? The early Christians, were they educated or uneducated? Early Christians. Uneducated. Early Christians, rich or poor? Mostly, okay. Early Christians, uh, sitting in their house, uh, air-conditioned house going, or fleeing from persecution? Fleeing from persecution. Question, when you're fleeing from persecution, you're poor and uneducated, do you make a good scribe? No. Are the early Christian manuscripts difficult because they weren't professional scribes? Or did the early Christians have do the professional scribe thing? Not much, okay? Later on they did. Tell me about the Jewish people. Jewish people, good scribes, bad scribes? Professional? Give their whole life to copy scripture? The Masoretics, the, our best Hebrew manuscripts are come from about 1000 AD to 800 AD. They're called Masoretic, these Masoretes, Masoretic texts. They copied. Sometimes they would say, this page has to have 25 A's. And they would count up on the page 25 A's. If, if, if one of the A's was missing, they would do what to your manuscript? Question, were those people very careful? The Jewish manuscripts were very accurate. However, what's the problem? Our best Jewish manuscripts are 800 to 1000 A.D. What's the problem? Is 1000 A.D. late when Moses was 1400 B.C.? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in 1948, some little Arab kid was out for a walk along the Dead Sea. He threw a stone into a cave and he heard a clink instead of a clunk. And he says, something's in there. He went in there and found a big old canister. He opens the canister and inside there's all this paper and stuff. And he says, whoa, what's this, you know? I got, you know, burn fires with this all night and stuff. He pulls it out and turns out he sold, I think, I think they sold the first one for like 50 bucks. The thing is worth, uh, it's and priceless now. But they, and actually, do you know what they did to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Some of the guys, when they took it up to Bethlehem, they wanted to make more money. So you know what they did? They tore it up so they could sell 10 pieces instead of one. You say they didn't do that. That's, yeah, that's, they, did, they did. Okay. But anyways, but we got this Dead Sea Scrolls, 1948. What's the benefit? Why are the Dead Sea Scrolls, why do you say so much with respect the name of Marty Abig, a good friend of mine who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls and blew it open? I think it was Cave 4 or Cave 11. He blew it open with a Mac computer, actually. Why, why do I have so much respect for Marty? The Dead Sea Scrolls, our best Hebrew manuscripts were 800 to 1,000. 
The Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948 jumped us back a thousand years to before the time of Christ. That's a thousand year jump. Can we now check how good those manuscripts are? Yeah, we got a thousand year jump now we can do. And guess what they found? Question, are the Hebrew texts accurate? The Hebrew texts are accurate. The Dead Sea Scrolls confirm this. Now, by the way, let me just tell you a story about a guy named Gabby Barkai. I studied under him in the 1970s, I mean after the Civil War. Gabby, Gabby Barkai has studied tombs in Jerusalem all his life, and I'm talking his life, and we're talking 50, 60 years. Gabby can walk into a tomb in Jerusalem. He knows every tomb in Jerusalem. This guy is like, okay, really bright guy. He walk up to the wall, put his hand on the wall, and he'll say that chisel mark was made at 300 B.C. This guy is good. He's the best in the world. He spent his whole life doing that. Now, what's the problem with tombs? Tombs, usually, they bury the people with all their riches and stuff. Usually, what happens to a tomb? Do the grave robbers get there and rip all the stuff off so you're left with, you know, you get a few pieces of barley and stuff. Can you do some carbon-14 dating on it? All that kind of goofy stuff, but it's, you're left with nothing. Lo and behold, this is in the 1980s. They're digging to make a new hotel or something, and they've got this steam shovel out there digging up, and all of a sudden they hit something. And they said, holy cow, this is a tomb. Question, you got a tomb in Jerusalem? Who are you going to call? Gabby Barkai. Gabby, get over here. We get a tomb. What happened was there was an earthquake. There was an earthquake, and the earthquake collapsed the roof of the tomb onto the tomb. Question, is that good? Yeah, all the stuff. They opened this tomb, and this tomb dates from 700 B.C., the time of Hezekiah, king of Judah. The tomb was, roof was clapped. They open it up. There's a woman in there, you can tell from the bones. She has got around her neck a little amulet made out of silver. It took them three years. They unrolled this, and on this thing, 700 B.C., it said something like this. And this is a good way to end the class. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious unto you and make his face shine upon you and give you shalom. You ever hear that? Did your pastor ever say, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you? This is the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6. Gabby Barkai found the earliest piece of scripture ever found, 700 B.C. Does it say the same thing that your Bible says? Same thing. So therefore, confidence in scripture and stuff like that. But Okay, see you next week.